The Late Morning Program with Nam Ras Podcast. Hare Krishna, everyone. You're listening to the number one Hare Krishna podcast in the world, the Late Morning Program. I'm your host, Nam Ras, and I'm very honored to have His Holiness Chandramoli Maharaj here with me today. Maharaj, thank you so much for joining me. Hare Krishna. Thank you. So nice. Maharaj uh, is actually... A connection that myself and Maharaj have is that we are both from New Jersey, uh, and and I feel uh, you know a kind of uh, um, connection with Maharaj in that way. But Maharaj has a very a long history uh, in the Hare Krishna movement, so we're going to detail some of that today uh, and hear about his spiritual journey. I think it's very valuable for all to hear. Everyone knows who Maharaj is, but as far as uh, how he came to Krishna consciousness and the details of that, it'll be wonderful to hear. So maybe we can start off there, Maharaj. Please tell us a little bit about how you joined Krishna consciousness, starting with uh, where you grew up and all that. Well, we're going way back to 1972. And uh, I guess you might say, like many people at that time, the atmosphere was devotees, people in general, were looking for some alternative to the present lifestyle. Right. And was, you know, the, the hippie era was still, still alive and it had gone on for some time. Um, I had, uh, before then, I had gone college for a couple years and I was in the service for a little while when I came out I was looking for some answers to what direction in life I should take and I I saw the traditional uh, answers that were given as the way to live was not something I was interested in I thought it was just well it didn't seem to give give me any fulfillment or any excitement i was looking for something different for something new so i started to search through various types of traditions and um, eventually i wound up in a place called um, denver colorado that was in the later part of 1972 and somehow or other in trying different spiritual paths different types of yoga, uh, different types of philosophical teachings coming that was quite profuse at the time from various types of yogis and others. I somehow or other came across some people who invited me to go to the Hare Krishna temple in Denver, Colorado. And that experience really changed my whole uh, life in the sense that I, I think I, I thought I had found something I wanted to investigate further. I didn't stay in Denver so long. I again moved back to my home in New Jersey. And then I start going to the, the Brooklyn Temple in New York on Henry Street. And that was in the beginning of 1973. My father had just departed the world um, few months ago and my mother was practically alone my sister was there when she was quite young so i was living at home and then uh, i was visiting the temple and i was uh, getting a little bit of a taste for krishna consciousness but i wasn't thinking that this is really what i wanted so uh, an interesting situation occurred in my life which kind of made the, the, the major change and that was one night I had a dream, and my father, who had just departed, appeared to me in the dream. Now, my father was quite religious. In fact, he was a very extremely devout Christian, so much so that in his life growing up, he had refused to accept military service based on the principle of nonviolence. Wow. And that was quite rare for Christians. People who were doing that in terms of religious people were mostly like the Quakers and other more or less uh, not so popular spiritual groups and, or mainstream spiritual groups. So he appeared to me in a dream and he basically uh, told me, don't stay home, leave. And he kind of pointed the direction towards Krishna consciousness. And then that changed my whole life that dream 
because my father and I were quite close and I really honored him. Although I didn't follow him in the same way, I, I, I had a lot of respect for his life and his dedication to God. And then I just, I just moved into the, to the temple, the Brooklyn temple, and I just was there as a bhakta <laughs> for a little while. And then, uh, at one, and I was just living there, going on Harinam, and reading the books, getting interested in meeting devotees. And I really, the experience I had in Brooklyn was quite powerful. As I saw that the devotees that were there in the temple were some people who were genuinely happy. I didn't know, I never met people who I could actually see who were really, really happy. And uh, this really brought me more closer to investigate Krishna consciousness more and more. My goodness. It was devotees who did it. The philosophy was also there, but it was more or less the experience I had with the devotees. They seemed to be intelligent. They were friendly. They were open. And they seemed to be really happy and satisfied in their life. So that inspired me to continue in that direction. After living there for a few months, that was in January of 1973, um, I was I was close to one particular devotee who was now in our movement also. We had met in the New York Brooklyn Temple and now his name is Devan Rita Swami. Oh. So we would meet at the Sunday feast. We were both, you know, exploring Krishna consciousness. So I said one day, I said to him, uh, I said, I like this Krishna consciousness, but you know, I don't like so much living in these cities maybe is there some kind of community that they have and he said and it would just all happen that the president of the uh, new Vrindavan community his name was Kaladri, was there at the program that evening and it was a sunday feast so he pointed me towards him and said you know you might talk to him and see what he tells you so i came and i introduced myself and i tried to somehow or other uh let him know that you know, I'd be interested in what the community he was in. And finally, I asked him, uh, can I come? And he said, yeah. <laughs> and then he, then I said, uh, well, what do I have to do? He said, just bring your money. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was thinking, hmm, interesting response. <laughs> but I wasn't so rich, so there wasn't much to bring anyway. <laughs> so... <laughs> so uh, yeah, and then uh, I came, became enthusiastic, and then I start speaking to the devotee who's now Devan Ritsma. I mean, I tried to encourage him to come with me, and so I did. I, 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 I said, let's go together. He said, yeah. So we made a plan, and uh, we were supposed to meet at Port Authority in New York and take the bus from... Uh, from Port Authority to Wheeling, West Virginia, which is right near the New Vrindavan community. So it was on a Saturday morning. So I showed up at the bus, just before the bus time, which was early in the morning. But he wasn't there, he didn't come. Oh, no. <laughs> so I, kept, I kept waiting and I kept passing up all the opportunities of the buses, one after another, as they were coming. And then Finally, uh, it was like six o'clock in the evening. I had waited the whole day, so he never showed up. So uh, later on, I just I understood we spoke more that he was not ready to leave New York <laughs> for various reasons. And he joined the New York Temple and became one of the uh, book distributors there. And then eventually he joined Hari Krishna Maharaj in Poland, reaching behind the Iron Curtain at the time. Wow. So, uh, yeah, but I just I just went alone on the bus. I had one book, Sri Ishupanishads. I read it about six times, I think. I just kept reading it over and over again. Wow. And I wound up the next morning at the New Vrindavan, uh, at, not the community, but at the uh, bus station. Had a phone number, called the New Vrindavan community, uh, let them know that I was here. They said, oh, yeah, we heard you were coming. We'll be right out. We'll pick you up. That was eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, nothing happened all day. Nobody came. 
<laughs> I don't know. It's just, this is one thing after another. So finally at 530, they came with a pickup truck full of sand and shovels, with two guys sitting in the cab, two devotees sitting in the cab. And they said, jump in the back. <laughs> so I sat in the sand with the sh shovels, and, the, and they drove me to the New Vrindavan community. Wow. And that was March 25th, 1973. What was your yeah. first service there? First service? Yeah. Um, His Holiness Radnath Maharaj was there at the time, and he was a cowherd boy. <laughs> So he was milking cows in the barn with other devotees. And uh, somehow or other, I got the service of separating the milk that was brought to me that was milked from the barn. I had to uh, separate the cream from the milk and then take the cream and then churn it into butter. Wow. <laughs> and then I would have to deliver the milk to different places and and the, in the community, which was just one or two places. But um, I started to churn butter. Amazing. <laughs> that was my <laughs> service, just getting milk from the barn and churning butter. I know butter. you you and uh, His Holiness Radnath Swami were close and still are to this day. But tell us a little about, about your relationship at that time. What was he like and what were you, you know, how was your impression of him? And because he had come from India, I assume, you know, at that time he had come from India. And I guess he was also, people were kind of not sure about him because he didn't want to cut his hair. And there was the whole story behind that. Well, um, I, he was absorbed in his service in the barn. And, yeah. uh, he was respected amongst the devotees as being more advanced mostly because he was very austere on a personal level. And somehow or other, we, we connected because he would bring me the milk and I would take the milk and then do my service of separating and churning. So that's how we got to know each other. But then later on, we the community also had a place and that was two miles from their, the main farm through the woods and into one little a um, uh, farmhouse that was called the Old Rindavan Farm. And um, so Maharaj was sent there to um, kind of direct that particular farm. <laughs> but at that particular time, it was mostly a women's ashram. <laughs> so, um, and he was all alone. He was doing the cooking for the deities. He was do, he was milking the one cow that they had. He was milking one goat. We had, we had a goat there, and he was milking that goat. <laughs> and uh, so the, the temple president of Duvrindavan, whose name was Param Brahma at the time, he said to me, he said one day, this was about, this was in December of that same year, 73, that uh, Radhanath, 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 um, he needs help. So could you go and join him in the uh, old Vrindavan farm and assist there? I said, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what I was getting into. <laughs> I said, you know, I was just trying to be obedient. <laughs> right. So I went, and then we were in this little farmhouse. And at that time, uh, the community leader, who was then Kirtananda Swami, had undergone this project of building Srila Prabhupada's palace. Right. So then gradually other devotees came and that place transformed into a brahmachari ashram. The women were moved down to the main farm. And so it was all brahmacharis at that time, after a little while, 1974. And um, I had the service of cooking for the deities and Radhanath was uh, Radhanath Maharaj was the uh, pujari and uh, we would stay the whole day at the ashram doing our service while the remainder of the devotees would leave early in the morning travel across the ridge and work to build Srila Prabhupada's palace and then they would come home at night or come back at night and uh 
that's how we became really close because we was just myself, uh, Maharaj, and one other person. Of course, he was Radhanath Brahmachari at the time. One other person, and the three of us were there all day while the rest of the devotees were building Prabhupada's palace. So he would, we would talk, we, he would talk about his experiences, uh, which later became the book, The Journey Home. Yeah. And I learned, you know, a little bit about the insight of India from him and how much he really loved India and how much he really longed to go back to India. Right. His talking about it was also his longing to, again, you know, take part in serving if he could. And, of course, later on, and that was a few years later, 1978, I think it was, that Maharaj was given that service to leave and to uh, go to Bombay, Mumbai, and help with the project there, which was also under the guidance of Kirtananda Swami at the mm. time. Mm. So for those years, from 1974 to 1977, 78, we were mostly together all the time. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And I, I learned so much from him in terms of what is Krishna consciousness, mostly the etiquette. He was exemplary in his, you know, his Krishna consciousness, more so than, than any of us. We were mostly quite ragtag group who was just coming off the streets learning about what is Vaishnav culture. But Maharaj had such a deep insight in, in Krishna consciousness and, and what is the behavior of a Vaishnava? What is the philosophy? And he was respected for that. Um, everyone, you know, acknowledged his position of that he, this person is the most learned. And so we would also always come to him for, you know, mostly for philosophical guidance like that. Wow. And I understand that it was very austere at that time in New Vrindavan. I mean, there's stories <laughs> that I hear of, uh, you know, oat, oat water and breaking the ice of the lake and taking a bath. And how, how do you how did you kind of deal with that being from, you know, you're, you're from New Jersey and you it was like such a, a change, it seems from from normal life. Like, why? Why did you do that? Or how did you inspire yourself to continue to do that? Well, <laughs> I think we didn't see it. So it was an austerity. There was no question about that. <laughs> uh, this is when we were living. The, the, the ice breaking episode was when we were living at the main farm. That's before I went up to Old Vrindavan. We had this little gat in which the devotees would take bath in. And it was outside. So in the winter time. We would go to the edge of the gat and we'd have these cut off milk cartons. We would dip into the water and usually pick up a little ice with it. And then that was bath. And you just throw it over you and you run as fast as you could back to the uh, <laughs> how, did anyone, how did anyone think that was okay? I still don't understand that. Well, not everybody made it. <laughs> right, right. Because <laughs> later on, one lady who was living in the community at the time in a different place she was always wondering why she's hearing all these screams in the morning wow. and then she then she understood it was coming from the bathers <laughs> krishna so we accepted it as being part of being there uh, i mean i didn't complain about it but I, at the same time it was difficult yeah but right after that then they built uh, a little, they called it a bathhouse, more of an indoor structure where devotees were taking. But we never had any hot water, never. Wow. Even then, everything was always cold water mm. for years and years and years. Hot water was just, you know, an idea. So. <laughs> what is, I mean, and this is kind of like a side point, but in, 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 in 2021, what is the austerity of the devotee? who's just living um a normal per you know normal maybe a grahasta most of us are grahastas what does austerity look like for for us uh when we are not able to do kind of austerities that the pioneers like yourself did 
which which I feel did shape you and shape the devotees of that time. But what would shape someone like me in an austerity to do? I mean, we can speak on from different angles, and we also know the responsibilities of the ashram. But I think you might call it an austerity, but I think uh, grihastas have a lot to offer because they have the foundation for the, our society. Majority of our devotees are in that ashram, the large majority. And so I think if those who are somewhat situated in their devotional service take up preaching in some form or another, that, that's an austerity that would benefit everyone. Um, I think, and we also need more and more preachers. There's, there's never enough, especially in today's society where there's so many opportunities to reach people from in so many different ways. Right. So I would say that would be uh, in some capacity or other based on one's particular situation. One should think, what can I do to assist Srila Prabhupada's mission? by preaching in the world or joining some particular preaching program that's already in function. Just to live, just to maintain family, I don't think was what Srila Prabhupada wanted us to do as a, in any capacity, no matter what ashram. He wanted everyone to be an example for what we were practicing by giving it to others. So right. I think that would be from my perspective. Yeah. Um, it's definitely an austerity to preach and to and to spread Krishna consciousness, share it with others. It's definitely an austere um, point. Now, coming back to the story of New Vrindavan. So then, when you were there for a number of years, and things started to get uh, things started to change, right, with the, um, the philosophy or the dress and things. Tell us a little bit about that. Hmm. Well, there's a whole episode connected with that which leads up to all the changes. Okay, please. Yeah. Uh, and it all centers around one person, and that is the community leader, and that was Kirtananda Swami, mm -hmm. whose previous life before he came to Krishna consciousness was a, uh, he was the son of a Baptist minister. And he, and he was very well-versed in Christian, Christianity, both in the practice and in the, you know, in the, uh, philosophy you might say and so at one point during the time we were there um this is this became a little bit uh, you know controversial there were people who didn't like him for whatever reason um and that's a whole story i don't really know how to open that one up in a way that is understandable but uh, he was attacked by a, one crazy fellow who was living at the community. And uh, we were doing a lot of construction work at the time. So we had a lot of materials for that. And this person had a, this, uh, what they call a rebar. It's a very, it's like an iron bar. And it comes in different densities. And he picked up this rebar and hit Kirtananda Swami over the head three times and probably almost killed him. It wasn't for Kaladri at the time who acted quickly. And I mean, it was really a crisis. He picked him up and he had to actually hold his head together for because it was, it was so badly damaged. He took him to the hospital and then he was in a coma for two weeks, at least two weeks, even more. When he came out, he was a different person. He started to revert back to his old ways again, and he started to introduce ideas in a more ecumenical way about how to execute Krishna consciousness. His somewhat powerful leadership, which he had developed where there was complete allegiance to him in the community, this person who had done this was a person who had come just recently and um, he was refused by Kirtananda Swami to uh, um, to have to get sannyas, and so he became angry. And on the encouragement of another person who was living away, that was his person who was called Sulochan, 
Both of them were against Kirtananda Swami for personal reasons. So that's what happened. And uh, later on, we learned that when somebody gets attacked in that way, there, there are good chances they could, they regress back to their old ways. So he had he had some severe brain damage at that from that uh, from that attack. So then he started to introduce Christianity more and more as a not as a side thing, but more or less as an, an expression of how we should, uh, you know, organize our day-to-day -day life. And that led to a kind of an ecumenical program of inviting people from all religious traditions to share their knowledge, their experience. And we started having conferences regularly once a month. And we had people from all traditions, Sufis and the Islamic community, various Christian groups, the Native American communities. And, and so we became somewhat ecumenical as a preaching program. And then that started to filter into more and more into the community and devotees started to become a little bit attracted to that. Um, and some devotees actually started to take up this parallel life of Krishna consciousness along with adding some of these other traditional practices into their day-to-day -day, uh, sadhana. So, so it's becoming then, less, it was becoming less like Srila Prabhupada's original program and more like a, a Christian or other religions added into it. And, and the rationale behind that was that we are in a Christian country and we would be we would be more effective in attracting people from that background as opposed to the uh, you know the Vaishnav. We kept the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, we kept the deities, all well, that was still there. But um, how we worshipped them and the and how we uh, conducted the, the the ceremonies and were uh, were kind of like Christian. Mm. We got a we got a bandstand where we had cellos and harps and uh, harmoniums, not harmoniums, but uh, what is it? Keyboards, mm -hmm. and we got a, a huge pipe organ. And so we, so that was the that was the kirtan. It was like more or less hymns with the Hare Krishna mantra in. So one thing led to another, and then pretty soon. The, the dress changed, and we adopted. This was all due to Kirtananda's influence. We adopted the Christian robes. Mostly it looked like Franciscan robes. And then the names changed. When people were getting initiated, they got more like um, names that were characteristics of qualities in English, such as strong faith and... and uh, what else? I can't remember all of the different names. Uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, strong faith was one. Uh, Humility or something. Yeah, yeah. Humble heart. That was one. Oh, wow. humble, humble, humble heart. heart. <laughs> Which I mean, from a from a from a Christian perspective, was quite nice, but. I didn't go along with it so much. I mean, I did go along with it, but I didn't really find it, you know, inspiring. Did, because anyone, I thought, did anyone think, like, we're kind of go veering off the uh, path here a little bit? Did anyone think like that? Yeah. And the, uh, some refused to follow, but they stayed in the community. Right. Hmm. Yeah. That was. And then, of course, Kirtananda Swami didn't force Radhanath Swami into that when he allowed him to maintain the Vaishnav dress and perspective and then he sent him to uh, India to preach there so right. yeah so he wasn't influenced by that but everyone else was how do you look back on those times that kind of weird things or kind of different things were happening um, mm. and 
Yeah, what's your perspective now being, you know, now being many years, it's been many years now. What, how do you look back on those times when you talk about it? I just think that Prabhupada's movement is the best the way Prabhupada gave us. Because <laughs> we, the way, the, way, uh, we, the way we were preaching then seemed to be nice. But, um, you know, too many things changed. And the austerity that Srila Prabhupada adapted for us in terms of the personal sense was being also being challenged by these changes. And so one thing led to another, and pretty soon we were way off. <laughs> and at one point, there was a division in the community. And then in that division, there were pretty much people on both sides. And we were actually, we were actually having not two morning programs, but one morning program with two of the same uh, religious practices in the morning. Like, in other words, we had two Mongol Artis, two Tulsi Pujas, two... Uh, Two guru pujas, two classes, all part of the same morning program. And that's how it went on for some time. That's the time when Kirtananda Swami was away from the community. And that was because of some legal stuff that he got involved in. And he was placed under house arrest for a while in the, in the, nearby, in the nearby city. So, uh, yeah. And then eventually... Uh, Prabhupada's movement came back. <laughs> but I was so relieved. And during that time, I also was given the service to leave and go to Cincinnati, Ohio, where I was, uh, I took up preaching there, and we had a preaching center there. That's a whole explanation of how Radha Swami had opened many preaching centers in the area, Cleveland, Oberlin, Cincinnati, um, um, where else? Columbus, Ohio, uh, Morgantown, West Virginia. And Maharaj was going from place to place doing programs every night, traveling in his van. This is after he had been in India for a while. And um, then I was asked to go to Cincinnati, Ohio. And then I somehow gravitated back to my old my. Prabhupada's traditional way of doing everything. I, I gave up the dress and went back to a dhoti mm -hmm. and everything else. I mean, we had beards and we had long hair and we had, wow. <laughs> uh, t lock was optional. I don't think anybody, anybody was wearing t lock. Mm -hmm. um, Kirtananda Swami's rationale was, in order to preach to the Westerners, we need to get rid of all of the, the trappings, external trappings of the Vaishnav culture and redesign it according to the, uh, you know, so-called Western American culture. We see that sort of now that devotees do also say similar things. We, to connect with the new audiences we need to you know change our dress or change the way we speak or what is your outlook on that well that's for preaching i mean also and you find that Prabhupada gave that you know that credence or that lead way in his books in the seventh canto he describes that when uh, in the in the pastime with Prahlad maharaj uh, when Prahlad Maharaj's teachers were accusing Prahlad Maharaj of being influenced by Vaishnavas in disguise, who were sneaking into the school and polluting, apparently, him, uh, Prabhupada gives the purport and said, we can change our dress for the sake of preaching. And he gave that, you know, that allowance. But in New Vrindavan, it wasn't like that. It was just like we were changing our dress in our morning programs and in the temples. And right. So that was that went a little bit outside of the preaching you know, element. Do you see, um, you know, ISKCON now in 2021, there even there's so many changes that have come since you were a young devotee in New Vrindavan. Do you sometimes worry or do you some are you concerned about the way things are changing even even past 
uh, you know, in the next 100, 200 years, things will continue to change, it seems. In my eyes, I feel like sometimes things may change so much that the original thing might be lost or watered down. What is your feeling on that? Now, this is a very complex question or answer, anyway. Um, I think if we stick, it's most important is to keep Srila Prabhupada's instructions foremost in all aspects, and we should be constantly reviewing that, discussing it and understanding it deeper in terms of how to apply those instructions as we continue on in both in our practice and in our preaching. I think Srila Prabhupada was complete in giving us everything we needed to know in order to both understand the practice, the philosophy, and the ideas that we can use in, in preaching Krishna consciousness. Um, we can water things down. Um, just for instance, uh, I, can, I just think of an incident where I have one disciple, she's in Slovenia, and she was asked to go with another devotee and this one group, this devotee, and the, the devotee told her, you can come, but we don't speak about chanting Hare Krishna, we don't speak about you know, the philosophy, we want to just somehow or other um, make friends with these people. And my disciple, she said, no, I can't do that. If you want me to come, I'll present, I'll present the teachings and the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra in a very simplified way. And then she agreed. Mm. So, yeah, if we don't keep these, and it's just how you present it you have to make it in such a way that people don't feel you know threatened by it if we get it if we if we if it's just, if it's the either or philosophy either you do this or you know you can't make it then that's not preaching that's just you know arrogance i think it's a learning how to give what Srila Prabhupada gave to us to, according to different types of groups and communities out there without changing the essence. Uh, keep Prabhupada's books, keep the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, and making friends and inspiring people to come forward in different programs that will be attractive to them. I don't think we don't know we have to do anything more than that. When you when you say Prabhupada's books or Prabhupada's instructions, it it's it's also that those instructions and the books can be interpreted in different ways. So something that you might interpret in uh, in one way, I may interpret in another way. So then I feel is where maybe it li- the maybe the difficulty lies of interpretation of the instructions. Yeah, then I think prior to that there has to be discussion. To understand what is what actually is the best way to apply apply this according to time, place, and circumstance, or time, place, and candidate. Yeah, um, and you can see by the results. You can right. see by the results. Just like something now we're doing this um, kirtan programs in different places and around the world to invite people into kirtan. But then, where do you go from there? Do you leave it at that? No, you bring in Prabhupada's books eventually after you, you gain a, uh, a following of people who are coming regularly. And then, but the most important thing is to develop relationships with each and every person as they come forward. So they feel, and we find that and this is somewhat of a statistic that people who are actually searching are looking for community. They're looking for something that they can find some people that they can really resonate with mm. in the spiritual sense. Right. So uh, if we're just giving programs without developing relationships uh, or having a program for developing relationships, I think we will we'll get some. But it'll be more effective if we open up and, and really see how to develop relationships with each and every person who comes. Yeah, I like that point a lot about community. Everyone is looking for some type of community. And if we do things without 
creating a relationship or we're just doing something for numbers or some numerical kind of uh, measurement of, of, of making devotees or a number of money or a number of books or things like that, then we may run into issues when it comes to spreading Christian consciousness. Yeah. Uh, it, it takes a little bit of extra effort. Yeah. What are, What is something, what is the most um, detrimental thing would you say in spreading Krishna consciousness or what is the most detrimental thing that can happen in a society like ISKCON uh, mm -hmm. that will stop the, the, that will kind of hinder our advancement as a society. If we start patronizing material ideas as ways to improve the quality of our devotional activities. We can wow. learn you, something. You again? Yeah. Patronizing and incorporating materialistic ideas which look very nice from the external point of view within society, because you know you see a lot of people in society have developed ideas on how to improve the quality of whatever they're doing in order to bring more people in to market their ideas better. Right. Um, if we start doing that, uh, we we can also gravitate down to a more uh, you know, you know, we get too broad, and then it's just like everything goes in. Mm. Um, that has to be, uh, this has to be very much, this is the, the leadership in our society, has to be very careful not to accept uh, people from the outside who may have been devotees, but are also connected with uh, materialistic organizations and want to adopt a, a lot of these ideas into our society. Um, I don't think we need anything new. <laughs> I think Prabhupada given and gave us everything. Yeah. What works the best is, is somehow spreading the holy name of the Lord. I feel like that's, that's the foundation. If we could find different ways to spread the holy name of the Lord and inspire people to take up Krishna consciousness based on the on the particular mindset that they have. And everything is there in Srila Prabhupada's books. So I'm a little bit concerned that we go and get too broad and start patronizing all these new ideas in order to make our society more, uh, more what? I don't know, more effective. Could you give an uh, example what you mean? Um, example. Hmm. Uh, yeah, um, I can't think of something offhand, but I know I can, if you give me a little time with that question. Sure, sure, yeah, I can move on to something else. Um, sometimes, you know, in the many years that you've been... Oh, a I, I, can, I can give an example. Yeah, please, please. Yeah, in certain moral and moral principles, if we start uh, putting them into our society as the ways to do things... You know, morality is the foundation for spirituality, but it's not necessarily always. It sometimes is contrary to, I mean, Prabhupada was very, very, very strong in, in speaking about, you know, taking guidance from the secular society. Right. Yeah. Um, in, the, in the organizational field, we might be able to learn a little bit but now with the, the devotees are using that as a way to, uh, you know, to improve. And Prabhupada gave us everything. And, you know, we added a few things after that. <clears throat> but he did also say, you know, you tax your brain and learn how to preach. He also said to Giriraj Maharaj that this movement will go on by organization and intelligence. So then... What is that intelligence? That intelligence is to stay within the realm of Srila Prabhupada's directions in order to, you know, present Krishna consciousness in different areas. Mm. And how we organize that, and that's, that will be the basis of uh, how we do it. So secular ideas, secular opinions, sometimes overshadow can overshadow, you know, our, our practice. For instance, uh, uh, well, we have four regulative principles. I mean, Srila Prabhupada was foundational 
and uh, establishing that as the bottom line, along with the ch chanting of the 16 rounds, you cannot go any lower than that. So we have to keep that as the foundation. And anyone who is below that can practice Krishna conscious with the idea that they're not up to the standard. Right. So we shouldn't allow that to be something that is you know, a compromise and then allow people to come in from that perspective and say it's fine. It's not fine. <laughs> mm. um, and it, there is some required austerity. Perhaps I'm getting a little bit on the side of the, the main question, but I'm thinking that, you know, this is that if we're looking for money and support from outside groups, just for instance, I'll give you an example. New Vrindavan, there was, uh, they were trying to do some organization there. And, uh, and then they met this one person who was, very favorable to the community, and uh, they, uh, he said, I can organize your whole community in such a way, but you have to allow me to do it. Hmm. Uh, once I, I'll do it, but you can't give me any, uh, you know, advice. I'll do it for you, and then the community was in a quandary, what to do. I think they opted not to accept that. Which was, a, which was, I think, is a, was a good decision on that particular situation. Like he wanted to, he wanted to organize it in like a, in in, in like an organizational like departments yeah. and things way. Yeah, it was it was a couple years back. It came to my attention through emails, and they were the devotees who were in charge in the community were questioning whether we should go that route or not. Yeah, but then it was rejected. So, um, you know, that these things can come in where we take help from materialists in order to improve our Krishna consciousness. We don't need that. <laughs> Everything's there in Prabhupada's books. We just have to come up to the standard and understand what it means to follow Krishna consciousness. I, don't, I just feel strongly that Srila Prabhupada gave us everything. We just have to un unpack it and understand how to apply it. Right. I, I it, it, Right now, there's a lot of disagreements among devotees, um, whether it's about all kinds of things, whether it's about, uh, you know, the current health crisis or, uh, you know, what have you. It's it, There's always disagreements, but it seems right now there's much more disagreement, especially it becomes more intense online where devotees are talking and things like that. What is your outlook on how to deal when devotees disagree on points? It seems that there's so much division. We uh, had sexually, and sexually uh, increasing too on different opinions. Yeah. Um, well, Prabhupada made each and each and every temple in Yatra somewhat independent, but then he created the Governing Body Commission to oversee and to understand when situations do get to that point to uh, somehow or other give recommendations and uh, help to solve these disagreements. So. I mean, from the philosophy point of view, we have the, the Shastri, Shastric Advisory uh, com Committee that's part of the GBC to help us understand more clear or at least clear uh, what Srila Prabhupada is saying and how to uh, apply that. That's there. Uh, from the practical point of view, I think we just have to re-emphasize the basic principles that make up the practice of Krishna Khan. The diversity sometimes comes with culture, comes with uh, a lack of understanding. So I think one of the biggest thing is we need more and more education of our devotees in the society. More and more seminars, more and more opportunities to study Srila Prabhupada's books, to um, and uh, yeah, to go deeper into what Srila Prabhupada has given us. 
I think education is, is somewhat lacking yeah. as, as a feature of uh, focus in our society. We tell, we tell devotees to read the books. That's nice. <laughs> but, yeah, and devotees are reading the books. But uh, we find, and, and I'll, I'll say something. This is quite controversial. Maybe it's controversial. Maybe it is not. I guess maybe that's part of being on the show. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we were at the ILS and the uh, ISKCON Leadership Sangha a few years ago. And so they decided to do an on-the-spot on survey at one of the meetings. And there were 259 participants, devotees in that particular, and they passed out these, uh, you know, forms, and you had to write down on the form how many times you've read Srimad Bhagavatam, how many times you've read Chaitanya Charitamrita, the main, the main books, Nectar Devotion, Nectar Instructions, like that, Bhagavad Gita, Sri Upanishads, Prabhupada's books. And then they uh, took it and calculated and did it in a percentage-wise. And it was quite, uh, I guess, shocking to see that even people were low, below 1%. They hadn't even read Prabhupada's books on one particular text even one time. And these were the leaders in our society. It was sh really shocking to see how low the percentage was. Right. And it, you know, we don't read and study enough. And and I think the next stage from reading and studying is discussion. And discussion learning helps to learn for application. And application brings realization. Mm. Yeah, it seems like the 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 kind of um, observation that I've made of of senior devotees in our in our movement or that there's so much uh, management that needs to be done and so much um, traveling and so many other things that maybe there isn't time for reading or or studying or staying in one place and just absorbing oneself in in uh, not as a criticism of course but as an observation uh, that maybe there's too much management i mean i mean i had mother urmila on and we were talking about the centralization of the society and how she was quoting probably different quotes from Prabhupada. we were saying that too much centralization is is not good centralization meaning trying to control every every aspect of the society yeah we should try to avoid that but we should also educate people the devotees in general yeah. So they can take charge and be responsible in in whatever area they're in. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's definitely education. I mean, ISKCON is an educational institution, right? And that's what Prabhupada said. He said, "We're not a spiritual movement. We're an educational movement based on yes. Vaishnav culture." He actually said, "We're a cultural movement," which means uh, that culture requires a it has a foundation in both behavior and in, in knowledge, both. And we also have to teach that part also, the etiquette that is that goes along with executing the practice of Krishna consciousness. But Prabhupada well, was very strong on that part. Yeah. Bhakti Chiru Maharaj was also very strong on the principle of etiquette. And he, he spoke about a lot, a lot about it, and he also wrote about it. Yeah. Yeah. What are some ways devotees can get more absorbed in reading and studying and education in general in, in Krishna consciousness? Creating groups, small groups of devotees coming together and, and reading and discussing Srila Prabhupada's books. And then occasionally inviting senior devotees to come into their group and then uh, doing a program with, with these senior devotees who can maybe help to give a greater understanding of the knowledge that they're being exposed to. But individual groups, uh, it's happening to some degree, but not enough. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and that has to be scheduled. 
it, there seems to be, and at least uh, this is my experience, that um, when it comes to the, all of the responsibilities we have in, in Krishna consciousness, the thing that gets, gets pushed to the side is reading. If you have time, you read. Yeah, I mean, we vow, we vow to chant 16 rounds, but there's no vows of, of reading a certain amount per day or, you know, some kind of measured amount. You know, I, I had one, um, one of the SGGS meeting uh, um, a few years ago. I was, you know, somewhat, you might call it pretense. I just, I got up and said that we should, include that as part of the vow for initiation that we <laughs> agree to read Srila Prabhupada's books every day and right. then you know that would be you know part of it what was and the reaction I get <laughs> somehow they changed the subject <laughs> <laughs> it didn't go very far actually one one sannyasi uh, <laughs> kind of blasted me saying Prabhupada never said that so mm -hmm. that's as far as it went I didn't get into a big debate <laughs> so. right right but Prabhupada you know did say it not in connection with initiation but he did say it in terms of what he expected from us he said every each and every devotee in our movement should be able to speak the philosophy at any given time mm -hmm. To, to whatever audience is there. Yeah, I mean, with being a grahasta with children and and responsibilities, sometimes it can be almost impossible to open up the book and read. Yeah. What would you say to? I would to say me? the grihastas can do it amongst themselves. They can right. find time. They don't want to, they don't have to travel out they can do it they can even do it through the zoom no. but uh i started don't when the lockdown came in march of last year uh, i began a daily program with my disciples and uh it's still going on continuously every day really uh, and we haven't missed a day yet some days because of me traveling I, i'm missing that time period so i arrange for someone else to do it for me mm -hmm. but the group is continuing and so we and i've gotten a lot of nice or we say a lot of uh, positive feedback saying that well, we we're so grateful and because of that i've i've met so many new people who joined our show took interest in Krishna consciousness and are now in practicing Krishna conscious. Wow. What do you do? How does it go, the, the program? Well, I choose a subject. Usually I try to find something in the scriptures and then speak on that. Um, you know, if it's a particular time of the year, you know, like um, if it's like Ram Nomi or something, I'll do a whole series for a week on Ram Leela. When I'll, Kartik is coming up. We'll do something on Krishna Leela. Um, and then sometimes I choose a subject that I think might be of interest to the devotees like that. And I've also found other preachers who found interest in our program who come on and do it when I'm not there. So, right. yeah. So that's good. And now some of the disciples are also taking up the, the mantle and doing it. So it's helping others to come forward and preach. So um, I won't give it up under any circumstances. It's really, it's, it keeps all the devotees together. Yeah. Speaking of lockdown, what do you, what is your perspective on what's been going on? These big changes that have been going on in the world regarding the, the health crisis and other things that have been happening. Um, I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Well, it's kind of broad. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to say certain words as well, just to not be flagged by YouTube. But uh, <laughs> uh, also, yeah. 
we can keep it broad or you can keep it you can be specific if you want i think it's quite there's a lot of misinformation that's based on fear mm. i think what what is going on is not actually what's going on it's in other words we've always as an individual we always have to take care of our health <laughs> yeah and even more so now i think that becomes a a feature of our day to day life and not to become what we say infected but how it's being delivered is wrong in the sense that it's creating fear and fear when people act out of fear they they become confused because fear blocks intelligence you start and so when people respond to things simply out of fear without any intelligent investigation of what's ha actually happening which takes some time to understand these things i i think uh, there is an overreaction to the situation um supposedly um i'll say that word supposedly i had the covid virus back in october of last year around the same time oh wow. and um you know i treated it myself i didn't go to any hospitals and i mean i had some doctor's advice over the phone and uh and uh, after some time I, i was fine so i think you know basic hygiene um understanding you know how to um take care of yourself which is an individual thing and not to become overly fearful and uptight about what's going on i'm a little bit you might say on the i don't know far left or far right i'm not sure what <laughs> i'm not sure what side i'm on <laughs> but i uh, i think there's a lot of propaganda going on there for money making that's going on with all of this uh news that comes on the, the media yeah it's more like making money and it's not so much about health or i feel like sometimes devotees forget that devotees aren't running the world <laughs> that's how i think <laughs> yeah well, we can maybe run our little area but that's about all exactly i mean who's who's running everything else it's not devotees it's krishna <laughs> it's krishna yes yes definitely it's krishna yeah my um, uh, one of the things that i did when this uh, when the lockdowns came on and supposedly all these statistics came out uh, i increased my rounds <laughs> wow the first thing i did and i started i was chanting 20 rounds a day and i started chanting 32 rounds every day and i did that for a long time and that helped me to uh you know to feel a little bit more protected and free from all of the you know apparent uh dichotomies and what is what's going on what's not going on because you can talk to so many people and you'll get different answers right but a lot of people don't know so they simply adopt what's on the media I saw a little cartoon it said uh, if you want to be free from fear just turn off your television exactly <laughs> turn, turn off your yeah turn off your uh, egg, outside media so uh, i uh, i think the bodies get too much connected to the external environment and start believing all of that stuff when some of it has some value but most of it doesn't I'm not being very specific because that requires a lot of discussion but this yeah. is basically No, I like you I like you know your perspective what you're saying. I think um I guess my next next question would be what what do you feel about when ISKCON leaders hold a certain position? For example, you have a certain position but perhaps you're uh someone under you your disciple or someone may not agree with that and that that, can, that can kind of run into issues isn't it that some if if you're saying a certain thing but uh someone under you doesn't agree with that there's a kind of 
uh, a difficulty that lies there. So I, I've seen that in in the past two years of of different examples of friends of mine as as well who have uh, run into difficulty in that regard. I guess you're speaking about general practice of Krishna consciousness. No, in the sense of like your perspective of what's happening in the world right now regarding the health. Someone may someone may say, "Oh, but Maharaj, it's it's not the you know it's not uh, you know." exaggerated this is what's going on and people are dying mm -hmm. okay. and then so it's 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 putting their faith uh in question because you're saying something different from what they believe yeah i don't force that right i don't force them to have the same opinion as i do and and i also do some you know research in other areas to to fortify or to understand deeper what's going on but I can see by example, there is so much uh, contradictions in what is being said and what is actually happening. Mm. So, uh, you know, I don't put any pressure on my disciples or those who come to me. And when, and I don't even bring up the subject unless right. they ask, you know. Right. Yeah. But I sometimes, when I'm questioned, I'll say a few, some things that, yeah, you know, may may cause them to uh, think about their own opinion. Mm. They have to come according to their own understanding and not be forced because of what we say. Because we're a spiritual movement, and we're also concerned with devotees' health. And that's also part, because we don't want to see devotees unnecessarily go down the path of sickness without having clear understanding of, of what's happening or why. But we don't make that the agenda. That's not our agenda. Mm. Yeah. People have to come by the way of their own understanding. And I do post certain things that you know express my particular viewpoint of what's happening on this. And they can they can read it or not read it. Yeah. I guess um, something I like to ask devotees who have been around a long time is that you see. In your years of Krishna consciousness, there have been many devotees who have come and gone in the movement. What do you feel is the number one reason that devotees, I mean, not number one, but or what are most of the reasons why devotees fall away and how can we avoid that? <laughs> well, hmm, let me think. Um. There was a survey done by the the uh, one aspect of the GBC during Prabhupada's centennial, 1996, trying to understand that, and, and they did it in a, in a survey type of format. Um, um, it came up with three reasons. One, the first and most prominent reason was the devotees have were developing. Who couldn't develop real meaningful relationships with other devotees. Right. So they went back looking for those relationships outside. The second one was grihastas who weren't able to manage their grihasta life and still practice Krishna consciousness. In um, So they had to somehow or other distance themselves from that and focus on maintaining their family and doing whatever doing whatever else was needed to get their uh, uh, the foundation that they needed in order to maintain the family and the third reason was uh, using brahmacharis at, as fund collectors <laughs> which causes a certain fruit of type of uh, and mentality right you know putting brahmacharis those in the more well, everyone is in the renounced position from different perspective, even the Grihastas. But it's developed a certain fruit of mentality. So uh, right now, I think what is more needed to prevent that is education. More and more programs for educating our devotees on all different levels. Meaningful relationships is definitely... An important one, I feel. Yeah. Sometimes our leaders are too distant, too distant from others. We can fall into that. 
but that's not I mean Prabhupada was very personal with everyone of course he had a he had a mission and he was very much absorbed in his mission and it's not that everyone could see him all the time but when he was with everyone he was with them he was very personal extremely personal and that, and I mean that's that's part of his purity uh, that is his purity but that also has to be take a personal interest in each and every devotee and that the helps develops relationships and then it becomes more natural and people will accept whatever you have to offer as you develop that relationship and what is that relationship is and we're concerned to uh, help the devotee on any level even if it's on a material level Mm. They, if we can help them on that level, which helps to establish a foundation, then we can do that also. But yeah. we may not use our ourself directly. Many of the devotees have resources where they can refer people to help get help. Just like one, just something came up. One devotee was um, he had to leave the country he was in because he didn't have enough money to. Uh, fulfill his papers so he was help, asking for help so I arranged for the money to be sent to him and which helped him like that so you might say well is it the business of a sannyasi or a business of a guru to you know arrange for money for someone but no it's actually important because you know it helps to establish them and what they need and to practice Krishna consciousness so we should we should use whatever resources we have to help devotees on on, on on different levels, whether it's medical or whether it's you know just practical or whatever. How how would I know if I'm in um, meaningful relationships or not? Someone I might think that I am, but maybe I'm not. So what would you say are the characteristics of that that I can actually pinpoint the characteristics of pinpointing my own understanding of why I'm doing what I'm doing no like uh, characteristics of um, of meaningful relationships in Krishna consciousness well yeah genuine concern are we actually concerned or is it just a show <laughs> well we can do things out of duty and that's and that's not wrong, but we can do things because our whole movement is based on the principle of devotion, and then it means devotion to Krishna and devotion to each other. So that, is, I mean, people have different personalities, and how they develop relationships with others may also be, it is based on their personalities and character, but in whatever way it should be done. What's meaningful? Well, is the, when you see a person benefiting by what you try to offer, then it becomes something that you you're inspired. We want to help devotees. This is serving devotees is more important than serving the Supreme Lord, because the Supreme Lord is more pleased when we try to serve the devotees. Then we have to, you know, evaluate how to serve and what is the best way to serve. You know. In whatever situation so we look for Vaishnav Seva as a, a principle that ca carries us through now that can come through education come 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 personal concern you can come through many different avenues yep. but everyone should plug into that like that hmm. I always notice Maharaj you're always appreciating other devotees not criticizing how do you how do you stay away from criticism and how do I don't you... listen I don't listen to it <laughs> I right. try to, to avoid that sometimes you get trapped into that yeah but I, I especially learn from your guru Maharaj, and that's one of the qualities that is outstanding in his character he's he's non envious and non critical so that somehow rubbed off a little bit uh yeah i find it hard i find it hard not to be critical um i i i it's just like i'm a conditioned soul so so and i and i try to make things better I'm, I'm trying to make things better 
uh, when you're trying to help out and and make things better in a society that of your of your birth, so to say, there sometimes that requires crit- a critical eye of your own family to to make yeah. things better. If you're in that position, then good. That's your duty. Actually, it's not something I, that is a characteristic. It's your duty. But how it's done will make the difference. Mm. It should be done with concern and compassion, and not not with false ego, right. or with uh, you know I, I'm better than you are, and you say you have to listen to me. Mm. Uh, that that's a certain characteristic that comes with with interpersonal experience on how to deal with different types of people. I'm also critical. I'm critical of other of things. But on a personal level, I don't do that. Maybe I'm critical on a, on a broader level, like how Prabhupada was critical of, of the materialistic society. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know that that seems to be my nature also. <laughs> right. But yeah, I mean, if you're a guru, if you're a parent. And if you're a teacher, you have to lead your those who are following you or have faith in you. Right. And part of that is to see things and say, this is not right. That's a responsibility for, the, for people in that, the, these positions. Yeah. But, you know, recently we had uh, a... Uh, it was back in the early part of June, where um, I was a, was a guru sangha, and one of the uh, topics came in how gurus interact and treat their uh, disciples. So one of the things that was raised in the conversation that we should avoid is is demeaning and unnecessarily criticizing disciples in a way that is just an expression of our own dissatisfaction. Wow. You know, you can, I mean, it has to be done. I mean, Prabhupada was also quite heavy, but he was never motivated by anything but compassion. So we have to develop that motivation also. Yes. Disciples are not, they make mistakes. They, you tell them one thing and they can't figure out how to do it. Or, you know, in other words, uh, we, it takes a lot of patience. There's a verse also in Rishabh Dave's teachings in the fifth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, 15th verse, that when dealing with disciples, one has to be very, very patient. And so rather than demeaning them or putting them down or criticizing them, we should find ways to bring them up in a positive way. Yeah. Maharaj, um, I'd like to ask you if you could um, give some parting words to our listeners. Sorry to put you on the spot. I do this to everyone, but I, I think it's it's very important. You have so much wisdom to share, and we we got a snippet of it here, but just but just some parting words uh, uh, for, for, for maybe a conclusion, concluding statement from you. Well, the thing, you know, I, I guess I'm kind of one pointed. <laughs> I'm kind of you might call me spiritually now reminded. <laughs> <laughs> I just think chanting the holy names is we need to do more and more. To, and we need to get out on Sankirtan again mm. and revive the whole Sankirtan movement in the streets and, and bring devotees out of their places and go out in the streets. Where I'm staying in in Slovenia, during the whole lockdown, we were doing Harinam. Really? Yeah, even with the restrictions, we followed the, the local restrictions, which kind of limited us to a certain time period. But we kept the Harinam going. I mean, when it was impossible because of the weather, then those days we would skip. But Harinam book distribution should go on, you know, side by side, especially Harinam. And if we want to really push back the influence of this so-called pandemic, um, that's what's going to do it. 
Chaitanya Mahaprabhu demonstrated that when he marched on the Chan Kazi's house. More and more devotees out on Harinam. Imagine if the whole society was out on Harinam, the whole world would change in about the one day. <laughs> the holy name is so powerful. And when it's done together as a, as a society, we have so much to offer. I think we've moved away from that, and we th we're coming up with other ideas on to, how to improve our, our, our society. And that's, I think that takes away from this chanting that Srila Prabhupada emphasized as the, as the center sore or the focus of our entire movement is on the holy name. Definitely. Thank you so much, Maharaj. That's a that was a beautiful concluding statement uh, from Chandramoli Maharaj. If Maharaj, if someone wants to join your um, daily calls, how how they how could they do that? Well, I can, uh, we can arrange for a Zoom link to be available, and then from there they can. Um, of course, depending on where you are in the world, it's different times. But we use uh, four o'clock UK time as our standard which is um, 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, 10 o'clock uh, Central Standard Time. And, uh, you know, if you go farther, you know, east, then it gets a little later. But, yeah. Um, I think, I think I, you have a Facebook page, right, for that? Um, that's also concluded in that, yeah. Um, um, yeah, I see. I see that you were live eight hours ago on Facebook, so I think the Zoom is connected to that. So let me actually post here on the screen uh, for those who um, are watching via uh, YouTube or Facebook. Uh, you could find this at Chandramoli Swami on Facebook, and if you if you message that group, you'll be able to be put on, and you can also watch the live uh, classes that happen every day because there I see there was one eight hours ago, there was one yesterday, uh, and there was one the day before that. So it seems like they're being logged there on Facebook. Yeah, there was also one today a few hours ago, which I wasn't able to do it for health reasons, but it was done by another devotee. Okay. I, could, I don't have the Zoom link. Uh, I do have it. I just have to do a little research and find it. I could oh, send that's okay. it. Uh, for for maybe um, your your disciples or any of your followers who are listening to this uh, podcast, they could put it in the comments uh, when this is broadcasted, and then uh, some devotees who are interested in that can also um, uh, log in on on the Zoom as well. Okay. Well, Thank you, Maharaj, so much for, for joining me. I really appreciate hearing your story and, and a bit of your perspective on different uh, issues that we face as a society uh, in ISKCON today. Uh, thank you so much for, for, for that and, and taking your time uh, to do that. For all, of us, for all of those listening, you can find this podcast on YouTube and Facebook as well as all other audio podcasting platforms. Thank you again, Maharaj. Uh, please you. stay on while I while I turn off the live. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.